Texas Math Mundo audience, today is a very important topic. In the fall of 2023, the PSAT NMSQT exam is going digital. The purpose of this video is to make sure you can walk into that room, know what to expect, and maximize your score. This past summer, this summer, I was tasked along with a fellow teacher, Ms. Keisha Bruce, on teaching to a group of students the district identified as having the potential to become National Merit Scholars uh, semifinalists or finalists. And so uh, we tried to move the needle. And I created an intro PowerPoint with uh, me and Ms. Bruce created an intro PowerPoint with a bunch of essential information just to know before you walk in there. And just to immediately highlight some changes, the test will be shorter. The test will be adaptive, meaning the second part will change according to how you performed in the first part. You're going to be allowed a use of a calculator throughout the exam, which is a, a departure from previous practice. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of changes. You know, it's going to be digital. So make sure you stay tuned and listen to these changes. Uh, so all in the hope that you can walk in there in October of 2023 as a junior and become a National Merit Scholar finalist, which could potentially translate into a lot of money. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, pause and take a moment and ask that if you enjoy this content, that you hit the subscription button and the, and the, the, the uh, notification bell, that you smash that like button and that you leave a comment below. All right, so information on the digital PSAT for the fall of 2023 uh, coming right ahead. Let's go ahead and get into this PowerPoint without further ado. So again, Ms. Keisha Bruce and I taught the, uh, taught the class and uh, she is the capitalist teacher at Pasadena High School and she is an excellent teacher. There's her, a big old gap, and then me. Uh, so we had a, a, pleasure, a pleasurable time uh, trying to uh, mold these kids into National Merit Scholar finalists. So, uh, so this was the intro slide. Uh, not much here except for the fact that uh, Jaime Escalante, who is a, a teacher who inspired my generation through the movie Stand Deliver, he says, uh, you do not enter the future, you create the future. And that's absolutely true. So let's start off with what is the PSAT NMSQT? You know, what does the acronym stand for? And uh, let's get familiar with it. So, the PSAT and MSQT. So that stands for the Preliminary Scholastic Aptitude Test, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. The PSAT is a preliminary SAT exam that is used for assessing student academic uh, progress and for determining eligibility for the National Merit Scholarship Program. So you know I tell my kids, so this is important. If you become a National Merit Scholar, you might get two or three grand from the uh, scholarship corporation and that's great. Who's not going to turn down a couple of grand? That's some significant money. But having the title of National Merit Scholarship could potentially translate into tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, because you have that title and universities are aching to have talented uh, students attend their, uh, attend their classes. So having the title of National Merit Scholar is where the real money is, I believe. So scoring. So you get three scores when you take the test. You get two section scores and an overall score. And so, you know, when you're young, you know, PSCT 8, 9, that's for 8th and ninth graders, they have a different score scale. Uh, and uh, so you, there in the bottom, you can see the summary. Uh, what we're concerned with is the PSCT and MSQT, uh, particularly because it determines whether you can become a National Merit Scholar finalist and uh, potentially get some big time money. So that score, that scale is from 13, 320 to 1520. And each of the sections, you got the uh, uh, reading, uh, writing and language, and then the math. And each of them has a, a scale from 160 to 760, 760 being perfect, uh, which is a different from my days. My days, it was just less than the SAT by a factor of 10. So, but I'm old. All right. The most important tip, the one thing, so you can go to the bookstore, you can go to Barnes & Noble, you can get a Kaplan book, you can get a Barron's book, you can get all these preparation books, that's fine and dandy. But they're all gonna tell you, you know, there's no penalty for guessing. So make sure you answer every single question. That's the first thing and most important thing. Make sure you do that. Back in my day, there was a penalty. I think you got like a quarter point off for each one you answered wrong, but there is no penalty. Make sure you answer all the questions. And all the points are worth the same question. So whether you answer an easy question or a hard question, uh, they're all worth the same. So what is a National Merit Scholarship? 
So the National Merit Scholarship is a prestigious award administered by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation that recognizes students based on their academic merit using PSAT scores as the principal eligibility factor. The scores are used to compute the selection. Like I said, guys, you might get two or three grand or whatever from the National Merit Scholarship Corporation, but the title is where the real money is coming from. So the selection index, so how do you get a high enough selection index? Well, first of all, we gotta know how the selection index is computed. So for those of you who are interested, uh, you double the uh, reading and writing uh, language sections. So it says, your second score from reading, writing, and language, and math sections are each doubled. So keep, keep note, reading is one, one score, writing and language is another score, and then your math is a third score. So the verbal part counts for two thirds of your selected index score. So that's noted. Uh, it, you know, let me gripe for a second. I think it's heavily skewed towards the verbal people, but the rules are the same for everybody. So just deal with it, suck it up, know your verbal section. Now this particular video is for the math, because that's my thing, that's what I do. But please note, the verbal section counts for two thirds of your index score. So you got to kick butt on that one. But the math cannot be discounted. That's a full one third of the selection index. So they give you a selection index between 48 and 228. So even though the reading and writing and language sections comprise half the PSAT, they make up two thirds of your selection index. So note that. And also, the selection index to qualify for to be a National Merit Scholar finalist, it varies from year to year and from state to state. So we're going to take a look at that too. Um, so how is it computed? So the selection index is double the sum of your reading, writing and language, and math test scores. For example, a student with a score of 34, 35, and 36 would have a selection index where you add those three up and you times two. Please note that the reading and writing language are two scores that are doubled, so the verbal counts for two thirds of the selection index score, okay? Most students remember their section scores, you know, from 160 to 760, rather than their 8 to 38 test scores. The selection index is still easy to calculate. First, ignore the final zero in your scores, then double your writing and language and reading score, then add your math score. So they give you an example there if you want to pause the screen and read through it, or you can also go to the website. Cool. No, so for example, 1.5 million juniors took the test in 2022 for the class of 2022. Of those 1.5 million juniors, 50,000 students are recognized as either commended students, that's 34,000 of them, or as semi-finalists, 16,000. Now that's where you want to be for the real money uh, for the class of 22. So, uh, and then the semi-finalists are 16,000, the top 16,000, of which almost all of them become finalists, 15,000 out of the 16,000. And from there, uh, they start awarding money. But like I said, if you get the title National Merit Scholar Finalist, uh, that's where some real potential money comes in, all right? Especially uh, if you're an underrepresented minority, so. And so uh, here are some examples of index scores from previous years. I live in Texas, I'm from Houston. And uh, take a look, man, if you're in Texas, you gotta score better. So I read somewhere, if you wanna dig it up in the College Board website, there's a reason why the index scores vary from state to state. Something to do with the percentage of graduates, uh, I'm not quite sure, but you can look it up. It's on their website, uh, but it varies. So if you're in Texas, man, like I am, uh, you're, you got a higher bar to reach. You got a higher bar to reach. So this is just an example. And they have a computed most likely index score to achieve in order to become a National Merit Scholar. So you can uh, take a look at that. So what to expect, uh, guys, take note. Here's the nitty gritty. When you walk into that test, you gotta know what to expect already. You gotta go in there knowing the rules, knowing the format as to maximize your chances to score the best you possibly can on that PSAT. So, first of all, it's going digital. All right, everything's going digital. Uh, and you're gonna have two evidence-based reading and writing modules and two math modules. And the test will be adaptive. That means the second module will change in difficulty based on how students do on the first module. Using this adaptive format, they can use advanced statistical procedures, my understanding. Uh, to get to extract the same information they would have got from the old uh, paper and longer tests uh, in previous years. So the format. So you got a reading and writing one, which is 32 minutes, 27 questions, standard difficulty. You got a reading and writing two, which is the adaptive part. 32 minutes, 27 questions, adaptive difficulty. You get a break for 10 minutes, and then you get the math one. 35 minutes, 22 questions, standard difficulty, and then math two, 
35 minutes, 22 questions, adaptive difficulty, difficulty, easier or harder depending on how you did on the first math section. So the second is adaptive depending on how you did on the first. Significant changes from the previous paper and pencil uh, PSAT. Uh, so I got a compare and contrast chart here for the old PSAT, the new, new digital PSAT. So the old PSAT was about three hours long, including breaks in administration. The new one is a little over two hours long. It assesses the same skills as the longer PSAT by having an adaptive format. So apparently these advanced statistical techniques can be leveraged to give you a shorter exam frame. Uh, and then give you the times on the left of the old one. Less time is needed for test administration because students can download the test app ahead of time. Yes, you're going to want to download it. Uh, I have a slide here. You want to be thoroughly familiar with the uh, application interface before you step into the room, man. That way you maximize your, uh, you minimize your anxiety level, maximize your score, and your potential for uh, doing well. So test format. So the old test was one test for all students on a particular day. Now, because it's digital, they have different test questions for different students. The old test was paper, a uh, booklet with Scantron sheet for answers. Now you take it on a laptop the students provide, that the students provide or that the test center makes available. Uh, you can go back to questions. On, this, on the new digital one, you can still go back to questions. Questions can be flagged. So they're leveraging all this new technology. Uh, students can bring their own watches and calculators. Uh, and the new one, there's a countdown clock and calculator built into the program. Although you can still bring your own calculator. I usually have my math team kids bring their uh, TI Inspire, the CAS version. The CAS version is allowed on the, PSA, on the PSAT. Uh, so, uh, so it's in the program though. So you got a timer in the program, you got a calculator in the program. So it's all there, nice and convenient. But you can still write on scratch paper and, uh, and bring your own calculator. Uh, experimental questions, uh, ones that don't count as score are given in a section after the test. Here it's incorporated within the test. So there goes your compare and contrast for the digital PSAT and the old PSAT. On the math in particular, which was I was in charge of teaching this summer, uh, you had a non-calculator portion and a calculator portion. Please note, you have a calculator permitted throughout the test this time on the digital PSAT. That's a significant change. Uh, the formula sheet was provided at the beginning of the test section in the old paper one. Now the formula sheet and digital calculator are available in the program. So you have the, the formula sheet available in the program. In the old ones, you needed to bring your own calculator. Now you have uh, it in the program. Also, uh, I read somewhere that uh, the college board was responsive because people were thinking that it was too wordy, so they're going to try to make uh, the le more concise on the math on the math portion. Not as wordy. All right. So I'm a Generation Xer. I come. I grew up in a time without cell phones, and so uh, we really panic in uh, technology situations sometimes. You know, that's just a case with old people like me. Uh, but just, just so you know, you're going to be taking on a laptop and you need to download uh, the app beforehand. So go to that, uh, to that website, download the app. And as a student, I believe you can take a practice exam on there. So make sure you do that before the date comes. That way you have an increased comfort level and uh, less anxiety. And you already know uh, what the interface is like and there's no surprises. There's no waste of time trying to figure out the interface. So uh, go ahead, uh, the Blue Book app. Uh, go ahead and download it, get familiar with it, everything. It's your job to control what you can, and what you can control is making sure you're familiar with the testing platform before you walk into that room. Uh, so I was saying about Generation Xers, man, we're always worried, well, what happens if we lose power? What happens if, uh, if you know, my computer gets broke? Whatever. Here's the point. If they got these fancy engineers nowadays, they got all contingencies covered. So the application has been built to withstand internet outages. If the internet connection drops during testing, students will be able to progress through the test with no disruption. If a student's computer battery runs down, they can simply plug in, restart their device, and pick up where they left off. So these engineers, they got it all continues figured out. No worries. Just know your math and do well. Okay, so now with the digital world, you got all these bells and whistles to take advantage. So you can still mark for review. You got the testing timer, a countdown timer is there, which uh, you can hide the timer and then get an alert with five minutes remaining. There's the built-in calculator, although you can bring your own. I'm having my guys bring their TI Inspire CAS um, and also the HP Prime, so you can use them on the uh, SAT. Uh, there's a reference sheet available to you and you can do annotations. So all the bells and whistles that come with the digital world are there for you. Okay, now the math. This is nitty gritty, the math guidelines. 
So first, just some, some math. All expressions of variables are real numbers, so no complex numbers. All figures are drawn to scale. Every figure lies in the plane. None of this three-dimensional uh, embedded uh, figures. Um, so all figures lie in the plane. Uh, the domain of given functions is the set of all real numbers for which the corresponding value of the function is real. All right, so there you go. The general guidelines of the math. And so multiple choice is easy. It is what it is. Uh, you solve the problem, pick the correct answer from the provided choices. Each multiple choice question has only one correct answer. So simple enough, multiple choice. But the student produced response guidelines, you need to be familiar with these guys because uh, you, you don't want to be reading uh, how to, how to uh, enter the student produced uh, responses while you're taking the test. You want to go in there knowing already how to enter your student produced responses. So if you find more than one answer, enter just one answer. And we're going to see in the next slide is some examples. So the example slide will be good. You can enter up to five characters for a positive answer and up to six characters, including the negative sign for a negative answer. If your answer is a fraction does not, that does not fit into the given space, enter the decimal equivalent instead. If your answer is a decimal that does not fit in the given space, enter it by stopping or rounding up to the fourth. So you can either, if the decimal doesn't fit into the space, you can either truncate, truncate is acceptable, or you can round the last digit. Either way, they'll accept it. Now, if your answer is a mixed number, like four and one half, do not enter four and one half. Enter it as an improper fraction, nine halves, or its decimal equivalent, 4.5. Do not enter symbols like comma, dollar signs, or percent signs. So here goes the next slide, very revealing. So student produ produ uh, produce responses example. So if the answer is 4.5, you got in the middle column, you got the acceptable response. You could put 4.5, 4.50, or nine halves. All of those are acceptable and will give you full credit. But if you put like 41 over two or four space one half, not gonna give you credit, man. So enter it um, as a uh, improper fraction if it fits, but the decimal equivalent will work. So eight ninths, which is 0.8 forever, right? Uh, you can enter it as eight ninths, 0.888 where you truncate or 0.889 where you round the last digit. Both are acceptable. And you can also decide to include the leading zero point, the leading zero, those are acceptable too. What's not acceptable, if it's a 0.8 forever, is not filling up all the spaces. So keep that in mind, know that rule. Now, uh, it said that you can, you can answer, so the decimal is a spot, and one, two, three, four, so you got five spots, five spots to uh, enter uh, in this case. If it's negative, you'll have like a negative, and then the decimal, and then four digits, and so that's uh, six spots, so there you go. So if it's negative one ninth, you can enter it as negative one ninth, negative point one 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 one, or negative zero point one one one. And then uh, on the right hand side, I show you what's not acceptable. You gotta use utilize all the spaces there. All right, know these rules before you step in. Uh, don't be reading this and figure it out on the spot. It's just gonna take away time, and time is of the essence. So, what is on the math section? You got the algebra. You got the uh, you got the problem. I think they used to call it like the heart of algebra. Maybe they still call it the heart of algebra. You got problem solving and data analysis, advanced mathematics. I think they used to call it like passport to advanced mathematics. Uh, Geometry and trig. So you got all these topics on the math section. And keep in mind that PSAT is very similar to the SAT. Maybe just take away a few hard questions. So there's a lot of parallels from the SAT and the PSAT. That's why it's called the PSAT. So algebra, 35 questions, 13 to 15 questions, 35% uh, of the test, more or less, more or less. And you see all the sub bullets there. It is my intention to produce some instructional videos that will help you if you want to learn uh, some mathematics, the actual core mathematics uh, that are tested in the PSAT. So that's uh, that's future coming out. Right now it's just informative. So linear equations in one variable, linear equations in two variables, linear functions, system of two linear equations in two variables, linear inequalities in one or two variables. Usually just a bunch of algebra one stuff basically. Advanced math. Uh, so uh, you got a definition, you got equivalent expressions, nonlinear equations in one variable, and systems of equations in two variables, nonlinear functions. So all these I hope to produce uh, instructional videos in the future. Problem solving and data analysis, which is a little bit less, 15%. Ratios, rates, proportions, uh, percentages, one variable data, distributions, measure of center and spread, two variable data, models and scatter plots, probability and conditional probability, inference from sample statistics and margins of error, evaluating statistical claims, observational studies and experiments. All right, like I say, I hope to produce uh, some instructional videos. 
And finally, geometry and trig, another uh, 15%. Uh, area and volume, lines, angles, and triangles, right triangles, trigonometry, circles. So that's the core of the math, the stuff you know. Hey, you know the number one way to get a good math score on the PSAT? Is actually know your math. I know so many people spend all these times on calculator tricks, on test taking strategies. You know what? Know your math. That's the number one way to get a good math score. Know your math. And so, uh, as I was teaching this course this summer, I uh, told my kids, you know, you get, you get out of it what you put into it. So you got usually three character traits, character types in your classroom. You got the guy who does the minimal effort. Bro, when's lunch? So, hey, you put in minimum, you're going to get out minimum. Then you got the people who do the medium effort, which I say is you do the nightly assignment, participate actively in class. You know, hey, mediocrity, okay? So that's good. Nobody's going to complain. You're all okay, average. Now, but if you want to be special, if you want to be special, you got to be special. The most is. So uh, that means you're going to do everything. And, and to me, so I've read all the instructional books, and I'm not going to dog any uh, instructional books. You go to Barnes & Noble, you go to Amazon.com, you get a PSAT prep book, they're all going to improve you. They're all going to be good. But really, in my experience, and you know, I'm not being paid for this, I'm just telling you what my experience, Khan Academy is the best. You can hook up Khan Academy to the college board. If you haven't done that, you need to do that so they communicate to each other and they uh, give you a course of study that's very personalized and geared towards your weaknesses. So definitely, in my opinion, Khan Academy is the best. It's free. That's what I would uh, tell my child if they're preparing for the SAT or the PSAT. So there you go. Hey, and you know, talk is cheap, man. You got to work. Talk is cheap. So there you go. Some informational information about the PSAT. I hope that proved, proved, uh, that, uh, proved informative and uh, helped you better prepare for entering in October. Now, I will say a final couple of thoughts here. First... Uh, I know there's a big movement to go away from these high, uh, high stakes testing and a lot of colleges are kind of moving towards uh, away from, but here's what I've always told my math kids. This is your opportunity to prove that you're real, that you're about it, to prove your metal. So I've always embraced these standardized norm reference tests as a way to prove that you are legit. Because let's face it, there are a variety of different academic environments out there. Some environments you can be valedictorian, but the environment was not very challenging. And you know that SAT and PSAT can be very revealing. So uh, if you're on the math team, it helps because you can prove that you know, you're know you about it. Your, your background is real and substantive. And uh, so I've always embraced it as a way for my kids to prove that they're legit, all right? And you know, even though there's a movement away from these high stakes testing, I mean, how are they gonna compare people? You know, because class rank is not the same from one school to the next, man. That SAT, the PSAT, the norm reference test is very revealing. If you're about it, if, you're, if your academic substance is real, uh, it, should, uh, it should translate to a good score. Um, now, if you wanna be special, you gotta be special. So, the PSAT, it has high stakes. Like I say, this National Merit Scholarship, my uh, office might give you two or three grand or whatever it is, but having the title is tr could translate to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, because you've proven that you're legit, all right? So best of luck. Let me take a quick moment, ask that if you enjoy this content, that you please hit the subscription button and the notification bell, that you leave a comment below, and you smash that like button. Uh, so uh, I do plan to produce, I have plenty of wonderful things in store for this channel. I do plan to produce some instructional videos about the actual math content on the uh, PSAT. So stay tuned for that. Uh, you know, my time frame is within the next year or two. So I'll be producing them as time is available. But I do appreciate your support. Thank you very much. My name is Saul Cantu and this is Texas Math Mundo. Farewell.